Welcome to Down to Earth That Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich. Light from the Land of the Sphinx. Chapter 36, Offerings and Sacrifices in Israel. Sweet Savor Offerings. Jehovah has bound together with bonds never to be broken, His glory and His grace. His glory having filled the tabernacle, His voice of grace was heard out of it, teaching the manner of Israel's approach to Himself. The manner of approach was by offerings, and these were arranged in five orders, the number familiar in the sanctuary. Three of these orders are recognizable in the practices of the earliest times, two owe their origin to the law given in Horeb, all of them present, symbolically, plain New Testament teaching on sacrifice. Both by order of thought and structure of words, the close of Exodus and the opening of Leviticus are united together. It will be well to look back upon the ways of God with men in relation to sacrifice before enlarging upon the orders as finally established in Israel. The present chapter will be occupied with the three orders of sweet savor offerings, and these, in their fullness, the scriptures place before us gradually. From the beginning of divinely given religion on earth, man had approached God by sacrifice, and, in the obedience of faith, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4, the fat, the inward excellence, of the victim, had been laid upon the altar. Genesis chapter 4 verse 4. Faith obeys a distinct word of God, hence when we read, by faith Abel brought to God a more excellent sacrifice, we understand that he had been definitely instructed by God in reference to it. Many centuries elapsed, and then we find that, sweet savor, of the, burnt offering, Genesis chapter 8 verses 20 to 21, mentioned. Noah builded his altar and sacrificed upon it, and Jehovah smelled its sweet savor and blessed the earth in the acceptability of the burnt offering. The patriarchs built their altars and offered their burnt offerings to God, and the scripture, by its manner of narrating their acts, indicates that sacrifice was common practice. The legends of Chaldea and Egypt show that the heathen practiced sacrifice from their earliest ages, that the deity received the sacrifice made to him, and more, their legends prove that man felt his need of propitiation. Lambs, oxen, and sometimes swine's flesh, formed the usual elements of the sacrifice. The gods seized, as it arose from the altar, the unctuous smoke, and fed on it with delight. The pictures of the gods of Chaldea depict them thus engaged. The sin offering is declared by critics, who will not believe that God gave to Israel the law of the offerings, to be an evolution due to human progress. And not to have been taught Israel so early as the era of Moses. In one of Egypt's very ancient legends, which takes us back to the earliest antiquity, men are seen in rebellion against the gods, and the gods are represented as slaying mankind. When I slaughter men, then is my heart right joyful, cries Hathor, afterward called Socket, the slayer, and represented under the form of a fierce lioness. After a variety of incidents, the great god Ira, whose heart was tender, says. Your sins are remitted unto you, for sacrifice protrudes the execution of the guilty. And this was the origin upon earth of sacrifices in which blood was shed. This legend carries back time to ages anterior to Israel and Moses. Enshrined within its monstrosities are the facts of human rebellion against God, of divine punishment of men, and of the acceptance of a sin offering for the transgressor. This record of the past is alone sufficient to prove that the idea of a sin offering was a possession of the human mind from remote times, and consequently that it was not an evolution due to tile delicate sensitiveness of improved human nature when Israel was captive in Babylon. Yet while the importance of sacrifice, and its propitiatory character, are written in the history of the human race, man, with strange inconsistency, seldom inquires into the two vital questions, is the sacrifice acceptable with God? Does the sacrifice atone for sin? The holy scriptures alone give the perfect information on the subject. The line of demarcation which from the very first separated true and false religion was formed by the letters of one word, sacrifice. The sweet savor offerings were the burnt, the meal, and the peace offerings. By its priority amongst the five orders attention is first directed to the offering which wholly goes up, which is wholly consumed, the ascending, or the burnt offering. The very fire which consumed it was the fire of acceptance, and by this fire Jehovah received it in its entirety. From it, the altar of burnt offering received its name, and upon it, the parts of the other offerings which were of a sweet savor to Jehovah, or which expressed the excellence of the sacrifice, were consumed. The burnt offering was sacrificed daily, both morning and evening, and the fire of the altar was never allowed to go out. Leviticus chapter 6 verses 8 to 13. Every other sacrifice in Israel was related in some way to the burnt offering the excellency and the acceptability of which to Jehovah, were patent to all the nation. The common idea that the burning either of part or the whole of the sacrifice pointed to its destruction, and symbolized the wrath of God and the punishment due to sin, does not seem to accord with the statements of scripture. The term used is not that commonly employed for burning, but means causing to smoke, and the rite symbolizes partly the entire surrender of the sacrifice. 
but chiefly its acceptance on the part of God. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 9. The verb here translated to burn is applied exclusively to the burning of incense, of the lights of the tabernacle, and of the offerings on the altar. It is in some places rendered in the margin of our Bible, to cause to ascend Exodus chapter 30 verse 8, Leviticus chapter 24 verse 2. The word for burning in a common way is quite a different one, and this is applied to the burning of those parts of victims which were burned without the camp. The first act of the offerer was the presentation of his offering, for unless Jehovah accepted that which the offerer brought, his act was vain. God did not respect the offering of Cain, and thus Cain's religion was stamped with worthlessness. The offering was presented of the offerer's own free will, and it was the best of its kind, a male without blemish. The offerer laid his full weight he pressed the burden of himself, upon it. As if there were none other save himself in all the world who approached Jehovah by it. Then he killed it before Jehovah, it was slain in his stead. Faith is here seen acting intelligently step by step in the presence of God. He then cut up the offering and washed its parts and its inwards, expressing in figure that the actions and desires of the offering were laid bare. And that the action of the water declared them to be pure in Jehovah's eyes. Here the acts of the offerer ceased. He offered, but did not offer up the offering, the latter was the priest's work, still both offerer and priest were necessary to carry out the symbols of the sacrifice. The rabbis mention the following five acts as belonging to the offerer of a sacrifice, the laying on of hands, slaying, skinning, cutting up, and washing the inwards. These other five were strictly priestly functions, catching up the blood, sprinkling it, lighting the altar fire, laying on the wood, bringing up the pieces, and all else done at the altar itself. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 7, were the words of Christ when he presented himself in incarnation to be the sweet savor sacrifice in death. He was accepted by God to perform his will, heaven opened over him, and the voice was heard, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, Matthew chapter 3 verse 17, thus did he, through the eternal Spirit, offer himself without spot to God. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. The priest took of the blood of the offering, and, sprinkled it round about the altar, and laid the parts of the sacrifice in order upon the wood, and attended to the burning. In this action our Lord in his priestly work upon the cross was represented, where he offered up himself. The offerer was accepted and atonement was made for him through the excellence of the offering. It was without spot it had borne his burden it had been slain in his stead its blood had been cast upon the altar, and the whole sacrifice arose as a smell of sweet savour to God. The death of the sacrifice was only a means to an end, that end being the shedding and sprinkling of the blood, by which the atonement was really made. The view of sacrifices of the ancient synagogue was. There is no atonement except by blood. Jewish interpreters thus speak, one soul is a substitute for the other. I gave the soul for you on the altar. That the soul of the animal should be an atonement for the soul of the man. The offerer, as it were, puts away his sins from himself, and transfers them to the living animal. Properly speaking. The blood of the sinner should have been shed, and his body burned, as those of the sacrifices. But the Holy One, blessed be he, accepted our sacrifice from us as redemption and atonement. There were three classes of burnt offering and five sorts of victims. They were taken respectively from the herd, the flock, and the fowls. While actually of descending value we do not say that typically they were so, but rather that in the bullock, the figure of strength in labor, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 9 to 10, in the sheep the emblem of self-surrender. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7, in the dove the very word for gentleness, a triad of types of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ is placed before us. The meal, or, more properly, the gift offering formed the second of the five orders. It was in a sense an adjunct to the offering which preceded it, a burnt offering, and the meal offering thereof. Leviticus chapter 23 verses 12 to 13. The gift was taken from the vegetable kingdom, and the cereal used was that which, all the world over, forms the bread of life for the human race frankincense. A small tree, usually 12 to 14 feet in height, rarely reaching 20 feet, of elegant habit. The true frank mass, or Lubin tree, inhabits, as far as is at present known, two limited districts. In tropical Arabia and eastern tropical Africa. Ellipsis. The whole tree abounds in fragrant gum resin, which exudes as a milky juice from the leaves and flowers, as well as from the stem when wounded. Ellipsis. The gum is obtained by making incisions in the tree. In due time it hardens, and its large, clear globules are collected. It is employed as a fumigating agent to overpower unpleasant odors. The first of the three classes, or five divisions, of the meal offering, deals with the fine flour prior to its being dressed for human food. The remaining classes or divisions deal with the flour, or the corn, as dressed for human food. The manner of this preparation is that common to daily life in the East. 
the greatest truths respecting the bread of life are shadowed forth by the commonest incidents of man's ordinary existence. The food prepared was either bacon in an oven, or rather an earthen pot, Leviticus chapter 2 verse 4, or bacon in a pan, a flat iron slice or griddle, verse 5, or boiled in a cauldron as frying pan, should read. Verse 7, or, if it were composed of green ears of corn, these were dried by the fire corn beaten out of full ears. Verse 14. The first offering of this order presents instruction of the deepest kind. Before man partook of the food of which the meal offering was composed, Jehovah had had his portion of it, in the form of fine flour, previous to its preparation for human consumption. The fine flour is a figure of Christ's perfect humanity, in all its holy evenness, and in which there was no harshness, or inequality. He is the bread of God, that is, the satisfaction of God's heart, and he is presented thus before he is shown to be the bread of life, John chapter 6 verses 33 to 35, for man. As the fire of Jehovah on the altar consumed the whole of the burnt offering, God is figured as having his portion in the incarnate Son, his bread. Man's portion in Christ is afterward presented. Upon the fine flour, oil, the emblem of the Holy Spirit, was poured, and frankincense, the figure of the sweet odors of the graces of Christ, was laid. The priest took out his handful of the fine flour, mingled with oil, and the whole of the frankincense, and this was burned, upon the altar, an offering made by fire. Of a sweet savour unto Jehovah. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 2. It was burned in conjunction with the burnt offering, and thus, in hallowed symbolism, the sweet savour of Christ in his death and in his life arose to heaven. The frankincense, which was a white gum, when placed upon the fire gave forth spontaneous and powerful fragrance. In the four remaining meal offerings, the gift was rendered suitable by fire for man's food, and from it thus prepared the offering was made to Jehovah. Christ, the bread of life, is given not only in incarnation for spiritual food to man, but in death. The living bread is he which came down from heaven, and, if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever, but the fire was necessary, the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. John chapter 6 verse 51. Broad principles respecting sacrifices generally are introduced into the instructions respecting the meal offering, that is, where Christ is figured with reference to his perfection as a man. No leaven, i.e., corruption, was to be present in any offerings made to Jehovah, for, in him is no sin, John chapter 3 verse 5, and salt, the emblem of incorruption, was never to be absent from them. The salt of the covenant implies the active sanctifying effect of God's will upon us. Honey was excluded from all offerings, while frankincense accompanied only some of them. The sweetness, which is so pleasant to man, was not to be offered to God, while the sweet odor his fire calls forth was the holy savor so pleasing to him. The morning and evening sacrifices of the burnt offering, with the accompanying gift, must be mentioned here. From dawn to dusk and from dusk to dawn all the year round, the sweet savor arose to heaven. Upon the altar of burnt offering, whose fire of acceptance was never to go out, a constant witness ascended, an unvarying testimony to Jehovah of the worth of the freewill offering. Whether Israel brought offerings or not to God, he preserved to himself the constant burnt offering, and this daily was the foundation of Israel's sacrifices. And we may apply this law of the offerings to eternity, for the fire of acceptance which occasions the sweet savour to God, shall ever be burning, it shall never go out. Leviticus chapter 6 verses 12 to 13. The third and last of the sweet savour offerings were the peace offerings. While Jehovah by the altar consumed the whole of the burnt offering, and while he with the priests partook of the gift offerings, Jehovah, the priests, and the offerer respectively partook of the peace offering. The order, as has already been observed, was in exercise before Israel camped in Sinai, and the Apostle Paul refers to it in relation to the fellowship at the Lord's table. We are all partakers of that one bread, and not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar, and he terms the altar of the heathen, a table, in this connection. The prophets of old termed the brazen altar, a table, see Malachi chapter 1 verse 7, in similar manner. Even in western lands the sense of fellowship still remains in the act of eating and drinking together. The sacrifice partly consumed by Jehovah on the altar, partly eaten by the priests, and partly by the offerer and his friends, was a great act of fellowship of the most sacred kind, God and man had communion together in the sacrifice. The table of demons, 1 Corinthians 10 14 21. Whatever was the order of the offering, certain great principles respecting the offering itself were maintained. It was ever offered without blemish before Jehovah, the offerer laid his weight upon it, he killed it, and the fat and the blood were ever devoted to Jehovah upon the altar. The frequent repetition of these directions indicates their immense importance. The offerer was to bring the oblation of the peace offering with his own hands to Jehovah. His was to be a direct personal act.
the fat and the breast were waved to and fro by the priest lifted up to express before Jehovah their value, and the giving and receiving back from him of the gift offered to him. The fat was burned, and the breast, received back, as it were, from Jehovah, became the portion of the high priest and his sons. The right shoulder fell to the lot of the priest who offered up to Jehovah the fat and the blood, the rest of the sacrifice was eaten by the offerer. The breast indicates the affections, and the shoulder the strength, of the creature, these portions were for those most intimately connected with the sacrifice, and thus it is with the sacrifice upon whom the people of God feed. The love and power of Christ in his death, form their most hallowed communion. This offering was, the most joyous of all sacrifices. From its derivation it might be rendered the offering of completion. In the law of the offerings, special instructions to the priests, the peace offering is placed last. And in view of the varied teachings respecting sacrifice, it comes in as the completing great act of fellowship between God and man. It always followed all the other sacrifices. Where there is true fellowship with God there will also be a real desire to communicate the joys of the feast to others. Thus to the feast of the peace offering guests were invited, and all were welcome provided they could sit down in a state of Levitical cleanness. Another principle should also be noticed, sometimes the peace offering would be sacrificed as a special thanksgiving. When this was the case, the offerer ate his part of the sacrifice on the same day that Jehovah received his part of it upon the altar. The joy of the feast on the offerer's part was not to be separated from Jehovah's consuming fire upon the altar. The importance of this law is great, for religious services may degenerate into seasons of mere sensuous excitement. There may be festivals, or services, which, while conducted under the name of Christ, are really altogether apart from God's thoughts about Christ, and as pagan festivals stir up religious emotions. So do such feasts offer the occasion for worldly entertainment, and to them the solemn word of God is attached. Abomination. There are critics of the scriptures who affirm that the beginning and end of the establishment of sacrifice came from a feeling of gratitude to the deity. And that in grateful symbolism his gifts should be rendered back to him. But if this were the case, evolutionary ideas had sorely disturbed this first simplicity in Egypt in Moses' time. Indeed, long before it, the system of giving gifts to the gods, in order thereby to obtain prosperity, was accepted orthodoxy. The gods who inhabited it the celestial world were dependent upon the gifts of mortals, and the resources of each individual deity, and consequently his power, depended on the wealth and number of his worshippers. The gods dispensed happiness, health and vigor, to those who made them large offerings and instituted pious foundations, they lent their own weapons, and inspired them with needful strength to overcome their enemies. It was, therefore, to the special interest of everyone in Egypt, to maintain the good will and power of the gods. Daily gifts were brought of every kind, animals were sacrificed on the spot, bread, flowers, fruits, drinks, as well as perfumes, stuffs, vases, pearls, bricks or bars of gold, silver, lapis lazuli, were all heaped up in the treasury within the recesses of the crypts. In Chaldea also such ideas as sacrifices being merely thank offerings to the deity, if they had ever existed, were changed in early times. The god had to be, nourished, clothed and amused. The statues erected to him in the sanctuary furnished him with bodies. And these were, served with food and drink. The priest solemnly invited the gods to the, sacrificial, feast, and, when they had finished their repast, the supplication of a favor was adroitly added, to which they gave a favorable hearing. O son, ran one of these invocations, at the raising of my hands, come to the supplicator and eat his offering, consume his victim. Strengthen his hand, and may he be delivered by thy order from his affliction, may his evil be driven away. It shall not be accepted, neither shall it be imputed unto him that offereth it. It shall be an abomination, Leviticus chapter 7 verse 18.